A very scary paper has just come out of the big AI gathering in San Diego this week called MURIPS. I'm going to talk about some of the other themes that are coming out of the conference so far. It's a weird pseudo-academic gathering, but this one really has me by the throat. It's called Artificial Hive Mind is the, is the headline of it, and I want to break it down for you here. Okay, so first of all, what is NeurIPS? NeurIPS is a really weird gathering in which a bunch of people come together as a sort of, uh, I don't know, like they're, they're, uh, they're kind of a, a uh, it's like people from academia, but it's also people from companies. Because we're in this weird world where there's this revolving door between those two where, you know, I'll be sitting across from somebody and he'll say, oh, I'm a full professor at such and such university. I'm like, oh, interesting. It's like, but I'm also a research scientist at Apple. I'm like, well, that's weird. I was like, so you're not a professor, really. I mean, you're a, you're you're now in the corporate world. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. I have, I have, you know, I'm a, I have full academic freedom. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, but you can't talk to me about what you're doing at Apple, right? And he's like, well, no, you know, it's that kind of thing. So there's this weird world where we have uh, now in which the smartest minds are very often kind of grabbed up by these companies. But one of the rewards they give them is the opportunity to, to publish, to publish publicly. So that's why you get to be at a place like Neurips. And Neurips is interesting because it's got a incredible number of papers. <laughs> the uh, San Diego Gathering has more than 5,800 papers on display right now. Uh, so, you know, Rayfusion, Rayfusion Enhanced Collaborative Visual Perception, Flow GRPO, Training Flow, Matching Models via Online Real Life. These things are, you know, a big, big, uh, it is a place to show off what you're doing. And really this place can set the kind of technical and intellectual and sometimes even ethical standards for the year. And a couple of themes have been emerging for me so far. One is the rise of non-American researchers, right? So here's uh, uh, the NTT scientists who are contributing 15 research papers to NeurIPS. NTT, uh, Nippon Telegraph, Telephone and Telegraph, I think. But anyway, it's the big Japanese telecom company. They've got these, you know, a bunch of papers there. You've got folks um, from, you know, and it's everything from, you know, how to make uh, inference more efficient to like, you know, model personality. I mean, they're, they're touching all the different parts of how LLMs and and, you know, fundamental foundational AI models are functioning. You got people out of Zurich, people out of all kinds of places dealing with this stuff. And I've been sitting uh, recently in some gatherings of people from like Asian Pacific countries who are talking about what are, you know, what are our priorities supposed to be as sort of government policy when it comes to AI. And one of the things they're all coalescing around is the idea that they don't need to be building foundational models. They need to become great at using them, making products out of them, pioneering their use in other languages, all kinds of stuff. And and what I'm seeing in this gathering is very much a look, a, a sense that that is is possible, right? That we're that it doesn't take American companies to do the big breakthroughs here anymore. It can absolutely be a place uh, like Japan or Switzerland or anybody else. Another big thing that's coming out uh, that that I thought was interesting was um, again because this is a, a weird, uh, you know, it's a weird world. Uh, was Apple. Uh, has their machine learning, learning research that they're presenting at NeurIPS. Um, and one of their papers has to do with uh, privacy-preserving machine learning. They're trying to make it very, very difficult for anybody to reverse engineer somebody's identity out of the anonymous data that you would use. And their standard is much higher than the industry standard, I would argue, on this kind of stuff. Because, you know, their brand, and it is a brand, is privacy. And they're trying to sort of tell the research community anyway, you know, we are focused on this. And if you want to do business with us, you're going to need to also be focused on this, which I take some comfort from. That's good. It's a branding thing, but hey, whatever it takes to get you to do the right thing. Another one uh, that I think has been really interesting, uh, there's a whole thing out of Bloomberg. Bloomberg has a couple of papers uh, at Neurips um, around the use of uh, uh, AI to do all kinds of uh, predictive financial modeling. Um, the degree to which, you know, you can, you can, uh, try to see, you know, are these papers gonna, um, you know, can we use, uh, ML and LLMs to do financial modeling? Is that going to create a sort of a better world or is this going to be maybe, you know, a, a, a new form of instability? It would be a worry that I would have about it. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, there's interesting stuff from NVIDIA. They have a whole thing. I'll show you here. They have a whole thing about how 
uh, a, a, about basically creating vision, language, action models, models that can see and decide very quickly. There's another paper, not from them, but from somebody else about self-reinforced learning where the robot teaches itself over time, right? Not just to avoid this kid in the street, but to do things like, you know, operate in a factory and learn as it goes in the factory. So very much something that's setting the stage for a much more robust set of robotics that use AI and vision to make decisions and take actions that humans would normally have to be involved in. But let's get to the paper that I, that really blew my mind. It is, so I'll just remind you here, I wrote a book once upon a time in 2022 called The Loop, How AI is Creating a World Without Choices and How to Fight Back. And I'm showing this to you not just to trumpet it, although I do all the time, but because I'm starting to see echoes of my thesis everywhere. And it's very spooky. And in this case, the echo is very, very strong in a paper from Neurips called, uh, I'll show it to you here, Artificial Hive Mind, the Open-Ended Homogeneity of Language Models and Beyond. It begins, large language models often struggle to generate diverse, human-like creative content, raising concerns about the long-term homogenization of human thought through repeated exposure to similar outputs. Basically, what they're saying is when robots tell you the same thing over and over again, you begin to believe that only the same thing is possible every time. So here's what they did. Here's the work that they did. They basically built a data set that they called Infinity Chat. There was 26,000 real-world open-ended prompts asking for things that would require creative writing or brainstorming or ideation, not just stuff like summarize this text or do this math problem, but like, help me think this thing through. And they then tested those on more than 70 state-of-the-art large language models, right? The result is that rather than producing a wide variety of responses as you would get from human writers, instead, the models showed a tendency to push the answers toward this narrow middle range. And the researchers refer to this as both intramodel repetition, which is models repeating themselves over and over again, and the even stronger one was what they called intermodel homogeneity, which is different models producing very similar responses. So you can imagine, right, that you're in this world of brainstorming with AI and you think, well, I'm going to, I've used OpenAI for, you know, ChatGPT for a while. Now I'm going to go use, you know, uh, Claude or Gemini or one of the other ones to get a more broad variety of responses, right? Well, what they found was different brands of LLMs tend to converge on roughly the same answers when given these open-ended prompts, okay? And the problem here is, so, so they also gathered 31,000 human annotations, 25 per example, right? Meaning they didn't rely just on automatic metrics. They also had humans looking at the answers here and trying to, and, and offering some evaluation about them. And the, the crazy part is just that like when, whenever these models, again, whenever they touched on subjective, like preference-based stuff, stuff that should be theoretically inviting a wide variety of responses, the model's outputs still collapsed toward this narrow middle, even though even in places where the human annotators had showed us big divergent you know, set of opinions on the answer, the model's outputs just collapse toward this narrow middle. And this is the thing that makes me, that bothers me so much about this, right? When I look at, so, so the thing that they are, of course, worried about, right? And the thing that they focus on here is this concept of artificial hive mind, right? The open-ended homogeneity of language models and beyond. They're worried that through repeated exposure to this stuff, we are going to come to a place where we, it could really be the, the end of pluralistic thinking. Basically, it's a structural risk to pluralism, to creativity, to, you know, diversity of, of thought and values and society, right? Mental, social diversity in human culture, they're saying is can, un, can be under threat, right? And, uh, you know, it is, it is a real this is literally the thing that I've I've just been sort of worried about for so long is that w what's going to feel to us like we are in this big open world of possibility is going to instead be a shrinking group of choices that aren't going to look like a shrinking group, but are a shrinking group of choices. And it may be that these guys have jumped in and, and you know, sounded the alarm on this in a, in a powerful way such that we can get out in front of this. But I don't know, man, like, I don't think that that's the necessarily the case. So I'll just point out that like, you know, of the, 
you know, you, you may be sitting there being like, ah, he's cherry picking, you know, this guy's cherry picking the, the things. And it's right. It's true that there are more than 5,800 papers, uh, on display, uh, you know, being presented in some form or another in San Diego this week. But what I'd point out to you is that this, uh, here are the, here's a list of the, mm, I'd say six or eight best papers. The reason I chose that one is it's on that list. Artificial Hive Mind, the Open-Ended Homogeneity of Language Models and Beyond by this coalition from Stanford, the University of Washington, the Allen Institute, Carnegie Mellon. It won the best paper in its track. This is a, a an important concept that the organizers clearly thought we all needed to know about, and so they did. So again, seeing your own work, you know, in a way you want to be right when you worry about the future and you write it down, but I don't like being this right. And so uh, I really hope people pay attention to this camera, or to this uh, camera, to this uh, paper, and uh, and think a little bit about how the illusion of choice given us by AI, the illusion that it's going to be this brainstorming partner that's going to bring out the creativity in us, could, if we're not careful, really turn out to be an illusion. And I would just caution us all against that. Thanks. The Rip Current is produced and created by me, Jacob Ward. And if you liked this show and you want more content like this, go to theripcurrent.com where I publish a weekly newsletter that covers these same sorts of stories, stories of the big invisible forces that have us all in their grip. And if you want to really do me a favor, if you could go to where you have listened to this or watched it and like it, share it, or even better, review it. Holy cow, is that helpful? It's the best possible way for me to find a new audience. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for listening.